For many golf fans, it's the Masters in April that makes Augusta a landmark. But just across the Savannah River in Augusta, Georgia, is North Augusta, South Carolina, a community proud of its tradition and history. The downtown historic area is full of charm, and in its heyday, North Augusta was even in the running with the unknown city of Hollywood, California, to become the next film capital of the world. This week, the best lady golfers in the world will try to tame Mount Vintage Plantation Golf Club. 6,200 yards of beautiful rolling hills, manicured bunkers, picturesque stone walkways, and greens that demand attention. Watch out, there's a new kind of masters in town, and this time the ladies will call it home. Hello everyone, I'm Kim Briel. The Masters may have its amen corner, but Mount Vintage Plantation Golf Club has this beautiful view from the 14th green to the scenic par 3 15th. This half hour will entertain some of the untold stories of the LPGA. Just ahead, Korean-born Grace Park on a mission, young and determined. 12-time tour winner veteran Rosie Jones, her thoughts and challenges after 19 years on tour, and a testament to friendship as a once-a-year caddy brings inspiration to one of the LPGA's own. It's been 35 years since the LPGA Tour has competed in the Augusta area. For three decades, the title holders championship was played at Augusta Country Club. In fact, in 1948, the title holders championship became one of the first women's events to offer prize money to the lady professionals. The total purse was $600. And the likes of Babe Zaharias, Patty Berg, Kathy Whitworth, and Mickey Wright were cashing in on the big bucks in that day. This week, the Asahi Roken International Championship is one of the LPGA's eighth highest in purse money at $1.2 million. There was an illustrious field for the inaugural Asahi Roken International Championship, but this event was not dominated by the big names. Kari Webb never got on track and finished at one under, nine shots behind the leaders. Annika Sorenstam began the final round six shots off the lead, but the Swedish star put together a charge that got her to within one shot of the leaders. But Sorenstam missed her last real birdie opportunity at the par 5 16th, had to settle for a fourth place tie. Sorenstam wasn't the only player making a move. Emily Klein hit a spectacular tee shot on the par 3 7th to set up an easy birdie that moved her to 7 under, two shots behind the leaders at that time. Klein later added a birdie on the par 4 14th, finished with a final round 68, good for a 9 under par total, but that would be one shot behind the eventual winner. The leader when Sunday's final round began was Chris Shedder whose 10 under par total was good enough for a two shot advantage after two rounds of play. Shedder played steadily on the front nine, but Tina Fisher made a pair of birdies and tied Shedder at minus 10. Meanwhile, Nancy Scranton had leapfrogged Shedder and Fisher and had a one shot advantage when she reached the par five ninth. Scranton hit what appeared to be a great shot, but the ball spun back drastically on the sloping ninth green at Mount Vintage Plantation. Scranton was able to save par at nine, but she made four bogeys on the backside and dropped a seven under and a tie for sixth place. Scranton's struggles on the backside allowed Chris Hansen to jump to the top of the leaderboard, but Hansen bogeyed number 14 from a difficult position behind the sloping green. Hansen also bogeyed at 15, but still finished just one shot behind the winner. Second round leader Chris Shatter looked like she might take her first win since 1992 when the day began. But despite this great shot on the par 5 16th, Shatter carded a final round 75 that left her in a tie for sixth place. Playing in the same twosome with Shatter was 29 year old Tina Fischer, a native of Germany who had played the LPGA Tour in 99 but was relegated to the Futures Tour in 2000. Although Fischer had just one previous top 10 this year, she held off every challenger down the stretch after taking a one-shot lead at number 15. Fisher made a pair of solid par saves to preserve her lead. After coming up short with her approach to the par 5 16th, Fisher putted to within inches of the cup to make par there. Then on the par 4 17th, Fisher hit a delicate chip shot from just off the green to once again save par. That steady play continued on the final hole. Fisher needed two putts to win, but almost finished it dramatically with the birdie. She was able to tap in for a final round two under 70, 
good enough for a 10 under total for the three day event and a one shot victory. The win was worth $180,000, which more than tripled her earnings from the first 19 events of this season. After getting congratulatory hugs from Chris Shetter and her caddy, Tina Fisher also received a soda shower from some of her LPGA playing partners. The victory gives Fisher exempt status for next year on the LPGA Tour. Well, obviously, I'm very happy because that's what everybody's trying to, you know, achieve out here to win. And um, I did it in the last tournament, you know, of the season. So that's really wonderful. And um, for me, that means, you know, that I have an exemption for a few years now. I don't really have to worry that much. I can go out and play, make a better schedule, not have to wait, you know, to get into the tournaments. And, um, and it's wonderful. Fisher's victory made her the fourth straight first time winner on the LPGA Tour. The LPGA's 1998 Rookie of the Year, Tina Fischer of Germany, stays consistent throughout. Her second round 66 was the booster as a final round 70. Gives her the largest payout of her career and a one-stroke victory over Emily Klein and Tracy Hansen. Hansen also enjoys her biggest check ever at just over 96,000. Lori Kane and Annika both fire 68s in a tie for fourth and a host of others tied for sixth at 209. She was the first player since Patty Berg in 1938 to sweep all major amateur championships. And in 1999, she earned exempt status on the LPGA Tour by placing first on the SBC Futures Tour money list. Let's meet Korean-born Grace Park. I picked up the game when I was eight. So I started for the first time, but I didn't really get into it until I was 11. But within a month, my score dropped from shooting 120s to low 90s. So that's when, you know, then. And I was so, like I wanted to beat my playing partner so badly that I had that competitiveness even when I was that young. From the age of 11, Grace Park began honing a game that fellow competitors would soon come to envy. At the age of 15, she was named the American Junior Golf Association's Rolex Player of the Year. And then in 1998, as a freshman at Arizona State University, she was named the Rolex Eleanor Dudley College Player of the Year as she and her teammates won the NCAA National Championship title. In 1998, Grace Park was on top of the world, invincible, winning the Trans Amateur Championship, the Western Amateur, and the coveted U.S. amateur title. She won a total of 55 national junior college and amateur titles. <laughs> I was good when I was a junior player and college player and amateur player, but I haven't been too good as a professional, so I'm hoping to get my past momentum back and start good on as a professional. The expectations were high titles among titles, and at the age of 20, she was the leading money winner in her first year as a professional on the SBC Futures Tour, granting her entry into the LPGA, where she believed the ride would continue. But it's a difficult stage, and players here ranked the best in the world. No, it's, it's not about other players, it's about me. I, um, for the first time in my career, my shirt, but not too short career, I was struggling with my swing. That's, you know, I, you hear so many professionals that struggle because they had little flaws in their swing, but not, I mean, I had a little, just a little bad thing that, you know, prevented me from playing well. Um, just a lot of doubles and triples and water hazards and OBs. And I'm finally learning that I need to be much, much more precise as a professional than when I was an amateur player. And, you know, I'm still young, I'm still learning. The statistics do reveal some of her shortcomings in this arena. But most would applaud a ranking of 34th on the money list at almost $350,000 this year. And in two years as a professional, she has won twice. I think, I mean, it's such a tough life out here. Um, I don't know, I mean, every player goes through a cycle of, you know, 
good and bad, and I just don't feel like I've reached that good point yet, but I've experienced plenty of bad areas down below the cycle, so I'm just hoping to improve on that. She's been crowned the glamour girl of the LPGA. Her innocent demeanor and electrifying smile captures the approval of almost every gallery. This new lifestyle on the LPGA stage takes a little getting used to, and she'll admit. It's like living a little gypsy life at times. Um, Is it lonely? It does get very lonely. I get lonely. I, I need people around me, and I do, but you know, it's something every person with this job has to get used to and learn to deal with it. <laughs> She's determined that she will one day be recognized as the best female golfer in the world. And with her competitive drive, no one should count her out. Superstitions, I always mark my ball with a 1977 quarter. I always have a Diet Coke in the morning before I play. And across the railroad, in the car, you gotta touch the screw and let your feet. Oh yeah, don't play with number three balls. Do not play with number three balls. I don't know what it is, it started in college. The numbers on my golf balls start on Thursday and go four, three, two, one to Sunday, so. As one of eight children, our next inside profile is no stranger to competition. With 12 LPGA Tour victories to her credit and a four-time Solheim Cup selection, Rosie Jones is still making a splash. Oh yeah, yeah, I was, you know, I came from a family of eight kids and uh, we, we were very athletic and I played a lot of softball, basketball, ran track all the way through high school and then uh, by the time I got into college I was, um, I, kinda, I gave up everything and, and uh, I just kind of fell into it, and, and thank God because you know I got a, um, a scholarship to Ohio State University where I, I probably never would have gone to college without my golf. And Graduating in 1982 as an All-America, Rosie knew exactly what she was going to do with her life. I never had any doubt as far as where I wanted to go with my golf, but um, I really hadn't won you know any big junior golf tournaments or big uh, collegiate golf tournaments or amateur events or anything or had even placed well in them until I was probably a junior and senior in, in, in college. So um, it took me a long time to really pursue or to, you know, start to uh, um, get the fruits of the, all the work that I, that I had put into it up to then. And, and, um, and it was perfect timing because by the time I got out of college, um, I really wanted to turn pro. Rosie's first year on tour was in 1982 where her best finish was a tie for 28th. It took six years for her to post her first professional victory. And once breaking the ice, Rosie knew just what it took to get into the winner's circle. The next year, Rosie was a three-time winner on tour, and her performance in 88, along with steady play in 89, got her a spot on the 1990 United States Solheim Cup team. Jones would also play on the 96, 98, and 2000 teams for her country. You know, when I go and play on the Solheim teams, I've been on four teams, and those have always been my proudest moments, you know, um, uh, playing for my country, and it's just been a big thrill. Twelve victories spanning over 14 years on tour. Perhaps this 40-year-old could be content with the achievements of the past, and presently she can boast of a season that puts her in the top ten on the money list at just over $700,000. You know, I'm still in the hunt for a major golf championship. I think that's a, um, it's not a make or break my career, but it's uh, disappointing. I've been so close over the last, especially the last few years, and, and, and come out without any. And, and um, you know, but I think that's the only one disappointment I can think of. There are many who look at Rosie Jones as a role model, as she exemplifies the model athlete who may admit that more hard work and determination went into her achievements than that of a great gift which handed her those titles. She too looks at those in the public eye who've overcome great odds in a quest to achieve. Um, Tina Turner. Do <laughs> uh, you see those legs on that chick? <laughs> She's what, 60? <laughs> Yeah. She was dancing and she was awesome. She was probably 50 then. <laughs> but um, no, I just, she's come a long way from, you know, a very, very tough life. And 
um, yeah, you gotta, I just have a lot of, a lot of respect for that. The LPGA was chartered in 1950, and now, 51 years later, it's the longest-running women's sports organization. Peggy Kirk-Bell of Pine Needles Lodge and Golf Club was a part of this history and this standard of excellence we now respect. This week, our corner of history is the Bell of Southern Pines. In the 1940s, she won the Ohio Women's Amateur three times, won the famed North-South Amateur in 1949 in Pinehurst, won the Eastern Amateur, the Augusta title holders, played as an alternate on the 1948 Curtis Cup team, and played as a full member two years later. The greatest thrill in golf for me was playing on the United States Curtis Cup team. That was my goal. The big names in women's golf back then were, of course, Patty Berg, who was the very first female to be salaried by a sporting goods company to promote their product, and Wilson had them a good one. And I watched her, and she said, now I will hit one from right to left. And I thought, she knows where it's going. You know, I, I just tried to hit it. The other big name, of course, the babe Diedrichsen Zaharias, first famed for her accomplishments in the Olympics and later for making her mark in golf. And babe, I can remember sitting in a room with babe and she'd say, call up some guy and she'd say, hey Bill, he said, how about putting on a, a woman's tournament? And said, he said, uh, well, how much? And she said, well, how about $2,000? And I'll bring the girls. And that was the beginning of the LPGA, and a friendship that still to this day brings a twinkle to the eye as Peggy Kirk Bell reflects back. She won the, the uh, Athlete of the Year. And she's in New York, and she's getting this award. And, and of course, there wasn't television or anything. And, the, and they said, well, babe, what are your plans? And she said, I believe I'll play in the men's open. And of course they shot out of that room and Babe's gonna play in the men's open. She had no intentions of playing in it, but she loved to give him a story. I kind of think you make your own luck out there. The only, I guess the only thing that I do have, if you have a ball that's going in the hole you're making a lot of putts with, I tend to keep playing with that ball, even if it's if it's not round anymore and the paint's chipped off of it, I'll, I'll keep playing with that ball. I won't take it out of play. So I like a ball that likes the dark. I used to carry a 64 silver quarter, but uh, once I reached that, I've, I carry a 59 silver quarter now, hoping, hoping I'll reach that goal someday. I have a lot. I should say I had a lot. Um, but I think the biggest thing I have, it's not really a superstition. I just, I really like to play with a ball repair tool that I have. Um, so I don't go out without that and I always say you know a private prayer before I go out so if I don't do both of those things I kind of feel a little out of kilter out there. The LPGA's Karen Weiss is 56 on the money list but this next story isn't about her position on that list but rather her rank in a very special friendship. While Karen was fighting to make the LPGA tour Pat was fighting to save her life. Now, this story isn't a focus on that battle, but by losing her left arm to cancer, it does make this week's story and Pat's job a little tricky for both player and caddy. Well, I think it was something like, could I ever caddy for you? If you, uh, if you, I get the opportunity, I think it went something like that. Yardages, slopes on the green, incidentals like the landing areas sloping one way or the other. Ridges on greens in low areas and bunkers, all of which caddies must make their second nature. Let's see, I'm supposed to clean the handles on the club, which I was told and forgot about today, and uh, take care of the clubs and keep them clean and have the, all the balls ready when they hit the practice. And obviously I can't even think of all the things I'm supposed to be responsible for. Pat Cooper is looping for tour veteran Karen Weiss. Weiss is currently 56th on the money list. The two met some 10 or 12 years ago playing competitive golf against each other in the state of Minnesota. Now this reunion happens once a year for a select tour event. 
you know, what an inspiration she has been to so many players in, in the state of Minnesota. And so for me, you know, to uh, have her come out here and strap the golf bag on and, and uh, you know, again, be willing to kind of put herself in that situation. We're fortunate we haven't had rain yet to deal with. You know, I mean, there are some possibilities, but for me, it's a great, you know, it's a great change of pace and I get to kind of remember, um, you know, how fortunate I am, number one, to be doing this for a living, and, and number two, you know, that I am pretty good at this game, but <laughs> all things being equal, you know, what she's done with golf is, is uh, far beyond what I will ever achieve. Uh, when we actually play, she'll take the uh, towel and go clean her own ball because I'll be running over and getting things situated. So, no, it takes a more helpful player. Karen has scaled down from her tour bag to a small carry bag with a stand. The two will have to work together from the smallest of tasks, like Karen cleaning her own ball, to helping Pat strap the bag on her back. Karen believes she gains more than she loses on this week. She's so mentally tough on the golf course that she'll be cracking the whip on me to stay focused out there. And that's really, that's the thing that I gain in the, the equation, you know, the little things about how we manage, you know, cleaning the golf ball are pretty minor compared to what I actually gained from her in uh, that mental focus that she has. A focus so intense that this one-armed caddy is one of the best amateurs in her state. Pat is a four handicap in Minnesota and the dedication and discipline she adheres to will carry over in helping her friend as she earns the title of caddy. Well, you know, the caddy's always thinking ahead. I'm a player, so I think like a player. And uh, a lot of times Karen will have to kind of nudge me. I, when we f started the round, I was looking for my golf glove. I was getting ready to hit. I, it was, I was having a hard time with the concept of what her needs are. And a good caddy is uh, always thinking ahead of what the player's needs are. Three times gone, one cut made, and a top 25 finish. A goal they will set their sights on next year. It shouldn't be any surprise who's at the top of the LPGA season money list. At just over a million six is Annika Sorenstam. Sayri Pak is just about a win and a top 10 behind Sorenstam at 1.3 million. And Kari Webb is the only other player to cap the million dollar mark in 2001. We've enjoyed getting to know the girls. Hope you have. And we'll see you next time right here on Inside the LPGA.